There is an update on supercapacitors from the University of Cambridge. Supercapacitors have an unparalleled power density and are already charging e-buses within seconds. As an alternative to the conventional battery, they would be pretty perfect if they didn't have this one catch. Capacity. In the past, I've talked about this problem a lot on my German channel, or about possible solutions to it. However, it is precisely these solutions that the University of Cambridge is now challenging in its paper published in Science. Instead, it presents a new approach and describes it as a breakthrough. What exactly the approach is, what the supposed breakthrough is, and how the whole thing can be viewed critically, that's what we're going to talk about today. And with that, welcome to the German Science Guy. I'm Dr. Jakob Boton, and in Germany, we say los geht's. Storing energy is one of the key issues of today, whether it's for electromobility, smartphones or sustainable energy supply. Everyone is looking for better, longer lasting and more efficient ways to store energy. And one possibility could be supercapacitors. A supercapacitor is the same as a conventional capacitor, only with a few differences in structure. So let's have a look at them. A capacitor consists of two electrodes, which are usually plates. Depending on how they are constructed and what material they are made of, they can store either more or less energy. In fact, if they can store a lot of energy, we call them supercapacitors. But no matter how much energy can be stored on the electrodes, they are always separated in the structure. In a conventional capacitor by an insulator and in a supercapacitor by an electrolyte. When an electrical voltage is applied to the electrodes, an electric field builds up. Negative charges, so electrons, accumulate on one electrode and positive charges on the other. There is no migration of electrons through the separator. Instead, a displacement of charges occurs on the respective electrode surface. The amount of stored charge is proportional to the voltage applied. Once the voltage of the electrical power source is reached, the capacitor is fully charged. In terms of energy storage, supercapacitors have a huge advantage over conventional batteries, especially when it comes to power density. Supercapacitors have a very high power density, which means that they can provide a large amount of power in a very short period of time. In other words, they could charge things like cell phones, laptops, but also cars or energy storage devices within seconds to minutes without affecting their lifetime, which is usually the case with conventional batteries. In China, there are even electric buses in operation that run on a capacitor. At certain bus stops, the capacitor is charged for 30 seconds, providing energy for the next 8 kilometers. However, there is a catch and a specific reason why supercapacitors are not yet so relevant in our daily lives, and that is energy density. That's the amount of energy stored per unit of weight. And in supercapacitors, it is relatively low, unfortunately. To put it simply, if you want to replace the battery in an electric car with a supercapacitor, thinking, great, then I can charge it faster, the supercapacitor would have to be incredibly large unrealistically large, because while you might be able to charge it in just two minutes, you could only use it for a few minutes as well. This is because the capacity of a capacitor depends on the surface area of the electrode plate, the distance between the plates and the separator. The potential is definitely there, which is why there are quite a few research teams working on increasing the energy density of supercapacitors. And the approach I have most read about in the past, in principle, was always quite similar. Researchers have been exploring the use of porous materials for the electrodes. They have a large internal surface area, which allows them to store more energy. You can imagine it like a sponge, because of its tiny holes or porous structure, it can hold more water than if it had the same size but no holes. So the key idea has generally been that these pores, or rather their size, determines how much energy can be stored in a material. Makes sense somehow. Before we get to talk about the nitty gritty of the University of Cambridge's new approach to energy density, we need to talk about something else. When you are a YouTuber, you have to deal with a lot of documents and PDFs. And as you might know, services such as Adobe Acrobat can cost a lot of money but there's a big contender. I'm talking about UPDF. With UPDF, you get all the PDF editor features you would ever need at one sixth the price of Acrobat. You get features like editing PDF text, images, or links, as well as batch processing or also compression. But there's one feature that has blown my mind. Let's cut to the chase. I'm talking about OCR. OCR stands for Optical Character Recognition. With UPDF's OCR feature, you can easily convert any scanned PDFs, and I'm talking any, even magazines, into easily 
create searchable and editable PDFs. UPDF has this super slick and clear UI, which I really like. I don't have to actively search features. I get to everything I would ever need within just three clicks. If you are now interested in UPDF, check out the description box below for an exclusive discount. Thanks to UPDF, let's get back to Cambridge's new energy density approach. But now there is a completely new approach. And the crazy part is that these researchers from Cambridge are actually challenging the previous assumptions completely. To be precise, the assumption that the pore size plays a key role in storage capacity. They now say there is no such connection. We will take a closer look at this statement later, but first let's talk about what they found out in the first place. In short, they investigated a range of different nanoporous carbon electrodes. Carbon-based materials are most commonly used for the electrodes in supercapacitors. Of course, it was not the same MRI we use for humans, but something called nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. This technique provides detailed insights into how and where electrically charged ions arrange themselves. This varies depending on the material. They focused on two key factors, the size of the pores and the structure of the material. By structure, I mean whether the material was more ordered or more disordered. As a quick note, an especially ordered material is graphene, for example. It's made of carbon, a very popular material for electrodes, and in it, the carbon atoms are neatly arranged like in a honeycomb. And as you might guess, that's not the case with disordered materials. In this context, disorder refers to how irregular the structure of the carbon material is. A highly ordered material would have large, perfectly aligned graphene-like regions. A disordered material, on the other hand, would have small, poorly aligned regions with many gaps and defects. Because of this disordered arrangement, these materials are generally harder to understand in terms of structure. That's also what the research group cites as the main reason why this parameter of disorder hasn't really been explored much when it comes to storage capacity. Simply because it is so difficult to study. But now they have studied it and here's what they found out. First, whether a material had large or small pores made no differences to its storage capacity. Second, they found a significant difference regarding the structure of the materials. They reported that the most disordered materials had nearly twice the storage capacity of the most ordered ones. And that generally shook the research community a bit, because many had long assumed that a more ordered structure can store more energy. That's also why a lot of work has been done with graphene as it is highly ordered. Because these results came as such a surprise, the researchers from Cambridge are calling it a breakthrough, a possible turning point in the field that hasn't seen major progress in some time. The next goal is to understand why the charged particles behave this way. But above all, they want to find out how strong the relationship between the capacity and disorder really is. They plan to use their findings to design even better supercapacitors. Which brings us to the big part or the big hurdle of my video where I look at the critical points of this new innovation. To better help me understand the relevance of this research, I reached out to Professor Dr. Roland Fischer from the Technical University of Munich. He is also doing research on supercapacitors for several years now. He wrote to me saying that he finds the conclusion quite interesting that ordered and optimized porosity in carbon materials might be less relevant than a specifically optimized disorder of the pore structure. These are completely new findings that the team has come across and that's exciting. Of course, this is still a fundamental research. That means we will have to wait and see how far reaching the entire approach really is. The team now aims to gain even more insights and eventually use them to design a new type of supercapacitor. If that one proves to work in practice and really is significantly better than all the others, then I would absolutely call this a breakthrough. But porosity is only one part. Other factors like electrical conductivity need to be considered. Recently, I've noticed in the comments that some of you have pointed out that we sometimes report on research where it's not yet clear at this stage whether it's truly a major breakthrough or not. I understand that this can sometimes be disappointing, but I want to comment on this. It is often exactly these small steps that can eventually lead to success. Especially in science, it is extremely rare that a groundbreaking discovery just happens overnight, even if that's often how it sounds in headlines or some social media posts. But the reality is usually made up of painstaking steps that might one day lead to success. That's why I think it's important to share updates about the smaller steps too, so that we can get a clear picture of what is actually going on in current research. And that's also why 
I always include the big but or the big hurdle in my videos, which is somewhat similar to the limitations usually stated in scientific publications, still we always try to make sure the innovations we cover are relevant, either because they hold potential or because they receive a lot of attention elsewhere and where I feel like there's some extra context needed. That said, I do take your feedback seriously and try to make things even clearer in the future. And I just want to say thank you for your feedback, by the way. I mean, I started the German Science Guy just a while ago. I had a German channel for a long time. And for me, it was a really big step to go in English because, I mean, my English is not perfect. As some of you already mentioned in the comments, I try to get better. Um, I just want to say thank you that you're subscribing. Thank you that you're supporting me with your comments. And if you want so, here's another video about an innovation. And of course, I will keep posting videos about new innovations with sources, with transparency. So yeah, it would be great if you follow this channel. And I say goodbye. See you next time, or as we say in Germany, auf Wiedersehen.